Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. You know, I don't know about you, but I needed that song today. Um, you know, there are times and situations where uh, we're called on to serve God or stand up for God. Uh, and, and you just look in your own self and you come to the conclusion you just don't have what it takes to do what God is asking you to do. And that's when the Lord just agrees with us. And he says, I know you can't, but I can. And so we submit to that. And today, that's exactly what I'm doing. I am submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart and in my life to preach this message. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter 5. And uh, I was really praying through for a number of days about what God would have me to preach for this uh, really last Sunday uh, that we'll be a part. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about getting back together next week. And so on the uh, 30th, on Saturday night at 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to be connecting again. Uh, for those of you that have to work on Sunday, uh, for those of you that uh, cannot come on Sunday for some other reason, 30% uh, to 35% of the people uh, actually work on Sunday and not able to come to church and so we're offering this uh, to them. If you know some people uh, that fit into that mold, uh, tell them about the Saturday night service and, and uh, let the word of mouth get through to those that uh, would be interested in joining us on our Saturday evening. So that's at 6 o'clock. And then uh, next Sunday, remember the new times now, uh, we will be joining together at 9 o'clock and at 11 o'clock. I suspect if you're like me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really care what time that it would be just as long as we got back together. And so I'm excited about it. I, I want to talk to you today about something that you don't read about in the papers. Uh, you don't hear about it on the news. It's the most unreported news in all of the world. And I've been keenly aware of it more in these last two and a half months than probably ever before. And it is the subject of Christian persecution. Uh, do you know that nobody writes about that? Nobody much reports that. You won't find it on the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news. But there's more Christian persecution going on today. 2020 than at any other time in our history. Even the time right after the crucifixion of the Lord for the first 300 years in the Roman Empire, it was illegal for a person to be a Christian. And if they were caught serving God and testifying of Christ, oftentimes they were tarred and lit up like a torch. Many times they were sewn into animal skins and thrown into the den of lions where they would be mauled and maimed and devoured by those animals. But there's more Christian persecution now than even then. You say, Mike, what, what, what are you saying? Well, I can tell you that while I am preaching this message uh, today, six people somewhere in our world will die as a result of their faith. But you won't hear about that. Uh, you won't find it reported anywhere that every 10 minutes, two people will somewhere in the world die because they name the name of Jesus uh, on their life. I, I was thinking uh, with the COVID-19 and uh, the, the, the way that the church uh, was dealt and the way the church was viewed and it was declared that the church was... Uh, not essential. Well, for some of you, that's not a big surprise at all uh, because about half of the church members today declared the church to be non-essential a long time ago and refused uh, to participate. And so they've just essentially said, uh, we, we don't need the church. It's not essential for our life. So that's not new for a lot of people. But for those of us who worship and serve God faithfully, uh, really, it was an insult to us. And, and so I, I'm thinking about what uh, the pandemic has 
been referred to as uh, birth pains of the return of Christ. And, I, you know, I, I agree with that. I believe that to be true. I believe it's uh, something that is going to intensify uh, as time goes on. And it is indicative of uh, what the Word of God in Matthew chapter 24 and in Luke chapter 22, uh, where the Word of God has been clear and plain uh, about what the signs of the times are going to be like in our culture just prior to the return of Christ. Well, I'll boil it all down just to simply say to you that following Christ is not for wimps. To stand for Jesus is not for the faint-hearted. You know, it takes a lot of courage to stand up for Christ. Uh, it takes a lot of wherewithal to name the name of Jesus and be consistent and really not worry about what people think when you do. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 12, the Bible says, Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now, notice what he said there. He didn't say uh, if. There, there was no condition on it. He didn't say maybe or might. Matter of fact, it was a guarantee that if you do what's right, if you stand for Christ, and if you live according to the precepts and the principles of the Word of God, you will suffer persecution uh, without a doubt. Jesus, in this last beatitude, I hope you have your Bible and look with me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 10, uh, Jesus said in this beatitude, uh, that uh, we need to be careful about what our response is when uh, we are faced with persecution and opposition, when we are coming under some kind of peer pressure for us to uh, cow down, for us to compromise, when somebody puts us down because of our spiritual convictions, and when we are ridiculed and criticize for the faith that we exercise in our life, the Lord gives us a whole plan in the word as to what we are to do when that happens. Uh, now, this country, the United States, we're not suffering much violent opposition. Uh, you don't find a whole lot of uh, violent persecution toward the church, but the things that are very subtle uh, that uh, causes us not to stand up but to quiet down. Very subtle pressures that are placed upon us to keep us from actually speaking the truth and yet speaking the truth in love. And so we wind up not standing up. We wind up not speaking out. We wind up not being the public witness that uh, we ought to be so we could just blend in, so we can go along, so that we can just conform to everything that is going on around us. That's the pressure that is being put on people today. That's the opposition uh, in this country uh, that folks are facing, not once in a while, but ladies and gentlemen, it is a regular occurrence. And what I'm watching and what is occurring, what is a fact of the matter is most Christians today would rather just be quiet rather than to stir the pot. Now, opposition, in my opinion, and according to the Word of God, is a good thing. Let me give you uh, three things that, that I believe, three good things that happen uh, through persecution through opposition. First of all, it fashions us. Write that down somewhere. It fashions me. In other words, when I am faced with the temptation to compromise, when I am faced with opposition toward my faith, it actually gives me the opportunity to become more like Jesus than I ever would have been had that opposition not occurred in my life. Listen to the Word of God in John chapter 15 and verse 18 through 20. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, uh, it, 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 would, it would name you as its own, really. 
uh, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. Now, now you understand, if you're ever going to become like Jesus, you have to experience the same things that Jesus experienced. you got to go through the same things that Jesus went through in his life. Jesus suffered loneliness, probably like none other that you and I have ever known. Do you think that Jesus was ever tempted? Of course he was tempted. The Bible says in every point, just like you and I are tempted. Do you think that Jesus ever got discouraged? Man, I'm telling you, when I read the Word of God and I see what Jesus went through and, and I just hear the tone of his voice in the Word, sure, he got discouraged. Do you think that Jesus was ever criticized? Everywhere he turned, every place that he went, everything that he did came under the scrutiny of people who were very quick uh, to criticize him. Do you think that he was ever lied about? Absolutely. Jesus was lied about. So if God did not spare his own son from loneliness and discouragement and critiques and criticism, who in the world do we think that we are that he's going to spare us from those very same things? So for me to be able to go through the same things that Jesus went through enables me then to be drawn more to his image than I ever would have been had I not gone through those things. Do you remember that Jesus was loved by sinners, but he was hated by people who didn't like goodness? The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 19, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. You ever been in the dark for a very long time? And uh, somebody maliciously and, and maybe just kidding around, but uh, you've been in that dark space for a long time and they, they, they shined a very bright light right into your eyes. Do you remember how painful that was? Do you remember how uncomfortable that, that was well when you have people that are living in darkness that are abiding in darkness when somebody of the light shows up all of a sudden they wind up being extremely uncomfortable you understand opposition also shows you that you are doing something right if somebody is talking ill about you because of your convictions uh, if somebody is criticizing you because of your faith, if, if someone is maligning you uh, because you're standing on the word of God that is rubbing against the grain of the culture, then congratulations. You're doing something that you ought to be doing. Matter of fact, uh, you know, if you're not being criticized, really maybe you ought to be asking yourself, why am I not being criticized? Why is not somebody saying something bad about my testimony and about my life? Now let me give you the second. Not only does opposition fashion me so that I can become like Jesus, it forges me so that I will be stronger in my faith than I ever would have been had the opposition not occurred. Now 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7 the Bible says these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So you take gold and you heat it up and you heat it up and you heat it up even more. The more you heat it up and the more you even it out and the thinner it becomes, really, the stronger and more valuable that that gold becomes as it is forged. The more heat that you apply, the stronger and more valuable that it is. Now, you've got to understand, when you're facing opposition because of your faith, it is going to make you stronger than you would have been had you never faced it before. And, and, and by the way, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, 
if you're not facing opposition, then your faith is not growing. Uh, you, you know, the strongest believers in the world, I, I mean the strongest men and women of God in the world, you're not going to find them in the United States. You're going to find them in those countries when people are being threatened with their very lives if they don't renounce or recant their faith in God. When somebody puts a gun up to their head and says, deny Jesus, and they don't deny it, you're going to find there the strongest men and women of God that are in this world. Every day in Syria, they are faced with that kind of opposition. Opposition fashions me. Opposition forges me and makes me go deeper in my walk with God and in my faith with Him. Uh, Kathy and I have uh, been facing some major, major uh, opposition to uh, our walk with God. And, and, and I'm just telling you, as we've been going through that, uh, God has done nothing but just deepen us in our relationship to Him. The Word of God is more powerful, more poignant than any other time in our life. So it forges us. Third, well, you're going to like this one. You may not like those other two about fashioning and forging because there's some pain that goes with that. But I do believe that you'll like the third one. Opposition favors us. You say, what in the world do you mean uh, by that? Well, in Matthew chapter 5, which is our text today, and it, it, it is found in verse number 10. Watch this. Blessed. In other words, God is getting ready to bless you. God's getting ready to favor you. Uh, God is getting ready to make you happy in God. Are they, who is he talking about? Notice which are persecuted for pleasing God with their life. The Bible says, for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now watch this. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your favor or your reward in heaven. Powerful words. Uh, can, can, listen to this. It, this is coming at it from a little bit of a different direction. Uh, and that is, if you're not facing opposition in your faith right now, uh, you're not racking up any eternal rewards. Because the Word of God says, I'm going to bless those that are walking by faith in their relationship to Christ. And when they get to heaven, there's going to be some major eternal rewards that are waiting on them. Yeah, I found out something. God doesn't, re God doesn't reward jerks. Now, if, if you're a jerk, if you're rude, if you're obnoxious, God's not going to bless you. But the Bible says that those who walk in righteousness, those who walk by faith, those people who live their lives to please God, he says, I am going to reward. So, so if you're facing opposition today, there are three things uh, that I want to leave with you. First of all, uh, you are being fashioned to become more like Jesus. If you're facing opposition, you're being forged so your faith will grow stronger. And uh, you're being favored because you're storing up some eternal rewards that will be waiting on you uh, when you get into glory. Now, it is uh, unlikely that here in America in your lifetime, it is unlikely that you will suffer violent opposition. But I am convinced that because of our culture, uh, you will face every single day of your life, you will be facing some uh, serious, silent repression. Maybe not op uh, opposition, maybe not violent opposition, but serious, silent uh, repression every day because we're living in a world and we're living in a culture, we're living in a country. 
uh, that is becoming more anti-Christian every day. We are becoming more and more secularized. Now, the Bible is very, very clear uh, on how you and I are supposed to respond uh, when we face pressure toward uh, uh, our life of faith. Let, let me give you six things, and, and I hope that you'll write them down, maybe in the flyleaf of your Bible, because you are going to need these at some point in time as you serve the Lord. So let me give you six things that, we're, uh, uh, that we are to respond, how we're to respond. First of all, uh, we're to be conscious. We're to be conscious. Uh, we're to be aware. Uh, we're not to be caught off guard when persecution comes our way. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Jesus himself said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So when tribulation comes, when opposition arises, don't be caught off guard. Don't be caught by surprise. Be conscious. Well, that's what Jesus said was going to happen. So don't be alarmed by it. Now, the second thing is be courageous. Not only be conscious, but be courageous. Uh, let me put it in a pretty simple terms. Uh, don't give in to fear. Don't give in to the temptation of living your life for the approval of someone else or fear that somebody is going to disapprove of your actions or your stance or your beliefs. Uh, when, when you understand that perfect love, according to the Word of God, perfect love casts out all fear, when you're focusing in on God's love for you and not on the opposition and not on what is oppressing you or suppressing you and you're staying focused in on God, then you don't have any time and you don't have any leanings uh, to live your life for the approval of somebody else. Uh, it, it is a major issue because you know that you are loved by God. Listen to 1 Peter 3. There's about four verses here that I want to read to you. And I want you to listen very carefully and, and hopefully uh, you're not being distracted by something there uh, where you are. But listen to this. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? I'm in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Now, now notice what he just said right there in that passage. He said, don't be afraid. Be courageous. And then he uses the word revere Christ. Don't be afraid. Don't be frightened. Worship. Now, you see, you have one of two alternatives. You can let opposition and persecution cause you to be afraid, or you can let it be a stepping stone that would enable you to worship. And, and that's what the Word of God is saying. That, 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 that's what Peter is saying here in the passage. Don't let opposition cripple you. Let it cause you to worship God. That, that's the alternatives that we have. We can panic or we can praise. So keep your focus of attention not on what is creating the pressure that is mounting on your life, but keep your focus of attention on Jesus and his perfect love for you. Now let me give you number three. We're to be committed. Be conscious, be courageous, and be committed. First Peter chapter 4, verse 16, he said, It is not shame to suffer for being a Christian. Instead, thank God for the privilege of being called by his name. <laughs> wow. Uh, what a powerful admonition. Now, let me ask you a question. If somebody insults you, uh, is it going to kill you? If somebody comes along and they put you down for whatever reason, is that going to kill you? If somebody comes along and they call you a name, 
Is that going to kill you? Is some troll on the internet or some social media outlet who's been following along you, is some troll baiting you to get into some kind of argument with them, is that going to kill you? Absolutely not. So don't let it cause you to run. Let it cause you to stand and be more committed for God than you've ever been in your whole life. Now, if you don't learn anything else today, I want you to learn this. Here's a little statement. It's not original with me, uh, but I, I found it and I thought, wow, that's so powerful. L listen to this. Here's the statement. I don't need other people's approval to be happy. Isn't that a good statement? I don't need the approval of other people to be happy. I, I know so many, and my wife does too. K Kathy and I, we, we see this all the time in our life. We, we know so many people that are living their life, uh, and they're living it based on the approval of other people. I, I, I run into people all of the time that are still living their life for the approval of some parent that has already gone to glory. It's silly to live your life with that. Don't, don't let someone laugh you out of following Jesus. I'm uh, studying Hebrews 11, you know, uh, several months ago. I don't know how long it's been back in the fall, I imagine. Uh, we stopped our study of the book of Hebrews, and uh, I've just been enamored with uh, chapter 11, and I've been gaining a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, resource material to preach uh, just in that chapter. And I look at those great heroes of faith, and I look at how many times that they were ridiculed, how many times they were chided, how many times they were put down, how many times that they were persecuted, and yet they just stood courageously strong, committed as a child of God in the face of all of that opposition. You know what? Listen, listen to me. No matter what you do, there's going to be somebody that doesn't like it. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you do it. Somebody out there is going to find fault. So you just may as well live for Jesus and follow him, and trust him, and obey him, and please him with your life, and forget about pleasing everybody else. Now let me give you number four, be clear, be clear. Uh, what do you mean, pastor, by being clear? Boy, this is one message I probably propagate more than anything else, is that you need to be clear about who your enemy is. And your enemy is not flesh and blood. Your enemy is not the government. Uh, your en enemy is not the educational system. Uh, your enemy is not another person. Your enemy is not another religion. Your enemy is not another nation. The Bible is really clear that we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in, in, in high places that seeks to exalt itself against the people of God. We serve a very mighty God, but we are at war with a very sinister enemy. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, the Bible says that he is the accuser of Christians. Now here's what his purpose and plan is. Now, now listen very closely. You understand that the real pressure that you and I as believers in our culture are facing is that we are facing the pressure to cave in. We're facing the pressure to give in and to compromise and to be silent and to be quiet and not to stand up on what God's word has taught us. You, you see, Satan hates God. Now, he can't hurt God. But I'll tell you what he can do. He has access to us and he can hurt us. And believe you me, when I tell you there is no greater hurt, no greater pain that we will ever go through than to see one of our children suffering. And Satan knows that. He has access to us. And so in order to get at God, what he does is that he comes at his children, to you and to me. And, and I'm just, I'm sure I'm not informing you, but I'm just reminding you, there is an unseen spiritual war going on all around you and uh, your life to make you 
miserable. And, and be, be very careful that you don't equate people as the source of the problem. They're nothing in the world but just little pawns in his hands to defeat you and to discourage you. We're at war with a very sinister spiritual enemy. Let me give you number five. We're to be Christ-like. You, you say, how are we to be Christ-like? Well, when we're attacked, if we're going to be like Christ, we cannot attack back. I want to read the text again if I could. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding great, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Jesus said you were going to be insulted. Jesus said you were going to be attacked. Jesus said you were going to be persecuted and mistreated and passed over and lied about. You understand that the world loves to find fault with Christians. Romans chapter 12 says, never pay back evil with more evil. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Well, <laughs> Well, I understand that passage, but I also understand that there are some people that it is impossible to live at peace with. And so you, the Bible says, as much as it is possible with you, then you are to live at peace with others, uh, to stay in that realm of being who Jesus wants you to be. Uh, in, in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, the Bible says, those who suffer according to the, God's will. I just want to stop right there because the health, wealth, and prosperity crowd can't stand what I'm about to tell you right now because sometimes suffering is in the will of God. All right? Sometimes we suffer because it's in God's plan for us. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do Good. All right. So let me give you the sixth one, and we'll close with this one. Be convincing. Be convincing. So not only are we not to retaliate if we're going to be like Jesus, uh, we're to go way beyond that. And the Bible says if somebody wants your shirt, give them your coat too. The Bible says turn the other cheek. Uh, I, was, I was speaking to one of the men in the church just this week, and he was going through this very thing in his life, and he says, you know, that passage of Scripture, the 70 times 7, he says it became a reality in my life just this week. And, and so it really means infinity. Uh, from now on, uh, we are not to retaliate. Romans chapter 12, verse 21, the Bible says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil. How? He says, with good. Isn't that a powerful statement? Let, let, let me kind of clarify it. Blowing somebody else's candle out is not going to make the world a brighter place. So he says, be careful about that. Jesus said to love your enemies. He said to turn the other cheek. Now, if you will do these six things, I believe with all of my heart, God is going to be pleased with you, and you're going to be blessed. I want to ask you some questions, and then I'm going to close. How many of you would come to me and say, Pastor, how do I keep these six things? Well, um, the thought occurred to me in preparation for today is that the worst persecutor of the church also became the greatest of the apostles. Think about that. So if you turn good in response to evil, it may very well be that you will win somebody to faith in Jesus Christ. So here's my questions to you. If for some reason our culture were to determine that it was illegal for you to be a Christian, is there enough evidence about you that you would be found guilty? Another question is this. Do you stand out as a child of God? 
or has the pressure caused you to melt and to conform and to quiet down that you now are nothing more than like everybody else? Another question is, uh, at what cost would you stay faithful to Jesus? Um, if somebody were to come up and put a pistol to your head and said, I'm going to shoot it unless you renounce Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, what would be your response? You say, well, yes, I'd stand for Jesus. Yes, I'd testify of the grace of God. Yes, I would proclaim his name. Well, if that be true, then why do you get upset now when somebody insults you? Why do you get mad now when somebody criticizes you? So let me close and just simply say to you, are you ashamed today of Jesus? Do you publicly declare him to everybody around you? Well, the Word of God simply says this. If you're ashamed of me down here in this life, I'll be ashamed of you when my Father comes in all of his glory. But if you will publicly acknowledge me as your Lord and as your Savior here, then I will publicly acknowledge you before my Father. What's it going to be? Have you placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ? Do you have the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? If not, I'd like to ask you right now to be willing to turn away from sin and right now ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of all your sin and come into your heart and to save your soul and give you the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Would you pray something like that with me right now, right in the confines of where you are as we pray together? Pray it out loud. Lord Jesus, Thank you for dying on that cross for my sin. Forgive me of all my sin. With your help, I will renounce and reject sin in my life. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Come into my heart and save my soul. Hey, friend. If you prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you to the family of God. You've done everything that the Bible teaches a person to do to be saved and go to heaven when you die. I would really be encouraged by the knowledge of that. Would you please go to our website and would you please just click on that section that says, I prayed to receive Jesus and let us know so we can pray for you and encourage you in the Lord. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing all of you up close and personal next weekend. God bless you. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.